What is that sound that always fills my ears? Is it the sound of the rain? The sound of a waterfall? Or could it be radiostatic? If not, I want it to be the sound of blood flowing through my body. I want it to be the sound of the blood circulating throughout me, telling me that I am still alive. Hmm? The light entering through a quack crack in the curtain was faint, but it at least told him that dawn had broken. Kinzo, still in the position he'd been when he woke up, still sitting in a chair and looking up at the ceiling, felt the blood slowly travel throughout his body. Judging by the clock, it was early morning, six on the dot. No matter how tired he was, no matter how deeply he slept, he always woke up at exactly this time, as though he had measured it with an hourglass. He didn't think of this as something to boast about, but he told himself that, as long as he could still manage this, his health couldn't be that bad. Kinzo was struck by a faint desire to see beyond the study door. After all, he might find the traces of someone's vain struggle to break through the door. A sign that someone had tried to select him as one of the first six sacrifices. <laughs> That was why he wanted to check whether there was a wretched mark on the door. The very desire was human. And that was why Kinzo did not check. He often rejected desires that came to him because he was human. By doing that, he could be immersed in a feeling of sufficiency, as though he himself had become a being that surpassed humans. He recognized human desires for what they were, and guarded against them. Things that a human would want to do, he resisted. This eccentricity and rebellious nature had surely given him a rare genius, making it possible for him to succeed in his exploits as he revived the Ushuromia family in a single generation. Sati Beatorici, Omae ga totta mutsu no koma wa nan na no ka? Soshite, tsugi naru te wa dou kuru no ka? Tanoshimase te morau zo. Watashi no mamori wa kanpeki da. Zenkai no you na buzama wa sarasanu zo. Hmm, 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 hmm. The servants woke early. They had to open the curtains, prepare breakfast and complete various other tasks to welcome the guests to a new day. Goda was the most enthusiastic. During the family conference he had been told to concentrate his efforts especially on cooking. And he had been specially exempted from several tasks that servants normally must do. Goda, who was a show-off, seemed to be feeling particularly superior because of that. He let Genji and the rest prepare the rest of the mansion and walked on making breakfast in the kitchen. Genji split the work with Shannon and Kanon and they carried out various tasks. Shannon headed to the dining hall and knocked. Last year, the family conference had continued into the early hours of the morning. It wouldn't have been odd if this year's conference had done the same. Considering the possibility that they were still having a discussion inside, she knocked. But there was no response, so she opened the door and said good morning.
おはようございますいらっしゃいませんか The room was cold and the conference seemed to have ended a long time before. There was a tea set on the table from which they'd probably been drinking, arranged in a way that would make it easy to clean up. Cleaning up the tea was a servant's job. If the family members were extra generous and cleaned it up themselves, the servants would lose face. So it was a truly pleasant act of kindness for the family to do only this much. As she approached the table to clean it, she noticed something like a memo that had been left near the utensils and cups. Since it was right next to the tea set, Shannon picked it up, naturally, thinking it was a memo for the servant doing the cleaning. Written there was not a request, nor was it thanks for preparing the tea. There was just a single word. Shannon looked at it blankly and read it out loud. <laughs> A small sound kept repeating over and over. Normally, that sound would have been too trivial to be worth caring about. If only I could stop hearing it soon, I could go back to sleep right away, she thought vaguely. But no matter how much time passed, the sound did not end. It repeated over and over. Ah, shut up! Who is it? Banging on the door this whole time. As soon as she realized that, she woke up. Someone was knocking. Then she noticed that it wasn't just a knock, but a voice as well. Rosa-sama. Rosa-sama. Ohayou gozaimasu. Ma... Ma... Mate. Ima ikimasu. It had been Genji's voice. Looking at the clock, it wasn't even seven yet. It was clearly too early to wake the guests. Did something happen that was bad enough to cause this? She felt her sleepiness increasingly fade thanks to this premonition of misfortune. Though Genji was a servant, Rosa had known him since her childhood days, so even though she was slightly defenseless in her pajamas, she opened the door a crack and answered. <laughs> Genji whispered something into Rosa's ear. For a second, it seemed Rosa couldn't understand what she'd been told. After having it repeated several times, she realized that apparently something strange had happened. Rosa closed her door for a second, changed her clothes quickly, and followed Genji towards the mansion. The chapel requires some explanation. It wasn't in the mansion, but in a grove behind it, a short walk's distance away. It had been built at the same time as the mansion. So though its walls had been repaired many times, making it look new from the outside, it was a very old building. Rosa dashed through the rain along with Genji. Just like the previous night, the rain was falling in earnest. Eventually, the chapel came into sight from beyond a thin grove. Just looking at it from the outside, it seemed a place of dazzling beauty where a pair of young lovers might want to get married. However, Kinzo apparently viewed it as a very sacred place. So Rosa and her siblings had been given strict instructions not to approach it unnecessarily. Even though they were all grown up now, approaching the chapel for any reason would still make them feel guilty. And also afraid, as if their father might get angry and hit them in the face. The servant's silhouettes could be seen in front of the chapel's entrance. Goda, Shannon and Kanon. Which meant that all of the servants on the morning shift had gathered. 
A short while ago, Genji had spoken to Rosa, telling her what the situation was. However, without laying eyes on it directly, she definitely hadn't been able to understand. It was probably the same for all the servants gathered here as well. Without seeing it with their own eyes, they wouldn't have been able to understand what was going on. On the door at the entrance to the chapel was something very large, drawn with a creepy stringy, stringy paint that made one think of blood. Something like a creepy magic circle. The servants looked at each other. Goda was the first to open his mouth. もう申し訳ございません。普段はここへは立ち入りませんもので、いつ書かれたのかはわかりません。じゃあ、最初に見つけたのは誰？はい、私です。食堂へお茶の道具の片付けに行きましたら。Shannon held out a memo with a shaking hand. Darenoji。兄さんや姉さんの字ではないわね。それであなたはここへ来てこれを見つけたのね。はい。どうぞ様。Cannon pointed a si at a single line of English written below the creepy magic circle. Until it had been pointed out to her, she thought it was just another part of the magic circle. There, the following words were written in English. Happy Halloween for Maria. Happy Halloween for Maria. This creepy magic circle was for Maria. Happy Halloween. Yesterday, only one person had said Happy Halloween to Maria. The key phrase matched. It was the golden witch, Beatrice. マリアは。あの子、いざこたちと一緒に寝てるはずよね。確認した。申し訳ございません。マリア様のお名前が書かれていたことには今気づきました。まだ確認しておりません。至急。何やってんのよ。私はマリアの様子を見てきます。それからク
She didn't want to get closer to the door of the creepy magic circle if she could. Rosa readied herself and approached, then tried pushing and pulling the knob. All she felt was the resistance of the sturdy lock. At that time, the events of the previous day swirled around in the back of Rosa's mind. That's right. When I met that witch in the Rose Garden, didn't she hand Maria an envelope? Yeah, there's no mistake, she did hand it over. When Maria tried to open it, the witch told her not to do it yet. And then she surely said, The time to open that will come soon. Rosa was sure. There could be no mistake. The envelope Maria had received was... After dashing back to the guest house, Rosa approached the cousin's room while hiding her footsteps, softly opened the door and peered inside. From the inside, she could hear the healthy snores typical of young people. There were four children. And Maria was there. Sleeping soundly. After breathing a sigh of relief, she entered the room with quiet footsteps. She was after Maria's handbag, which was resting on the sofa. Maria always liked carrying her treasures around with her. She was probably emulating how her mother would always carried her makeup with her. Of course, she was just imitating her mother, so everything on the inside was junk. In Maria's case, it was full of small, creepy occult items, notebooks describing things of that nature, and so on. Rosa had never been happy to see her daughter walking around with things like that, which weren't girlish at all. However, trying to force Maria to stop had resulted in a big fight, so she decided to let it be. A western envelope with the crest of the golden eagle. When she took it out of the bag, she realized there was a heavy, vaguely cylindrical object inside. She could tell by its feel and its weight. There was no doubt. This was a key. After turning around and checking that Maria was still sound asleep, Rosa tore open the envelope and the contents spilled out into her palm. It was a key with an old and intricate design. Rosa gripped that key and dashed out. Butler seemed to have noticed that sound, but after grumbling and turning over in his sleep, he started snoring again. Rosa approached the creepy magic circle once again and put the key in the keyhole. There was a strong resistance. After it resisted for a short while, it stopped resisting with a clunk. Then, squeaking with a noise that hurt one's ears, it slowly, slowly began to open. Her voice reverberated throughout the massive room. Of course, there was no answer. The 
chapel had a high ceiling and the air was cold. And even on this rainy unsettling day, it felt sacred for some reason. The servants timidly followed after Rosa. Rosa-sama, Ario. Kana noticed it immediately and pointed. Over there was the altar. In the place that would normally have a pastor preaching of God's love, there was a table that shouldn't have been there. At first, it looked like a dining table. There actually were gorgeous plates and utensils placed there, making it look like a child's birthday party or something. Upon closer inspection, the surrounding area had been decorated with pumpkins and black and orange ribbons. They were probably Halloween decorations. And there were people seated at the table. Three people on each side, facing each other, seated in chairs. They could be recognized at a glance. Kraus and his wife, Eva and her husband, and Rudolf and his wife. But if you wanted to be sure, you'd still have to go even closer and check. Because they seemed almost like dolls. Rosa and the rest had opened the door, entered all at once with the sound of many footsteps and called out, asking if anyone was there. And yet, there had been no reaction. Even if Rosa and the rest assumed they were being ignored, you'd still expect there to be some kind of reaction. And there hadn't been even that. So at first, it felt like someone had set down some dolls that greatly resembled those people. By now, it wasn't just Rosa, Shannon and Kanan, and even Goda. They were all fighting frantically with the creepy emotion that grasped their hearts. Nisa. Elsa. As she walked towards the altar, she called out again, but there was still no reaction. Yes, by now, Rosa was sure of it. She was sure these weren't dolls. But the people themselves... <coughs> they grew close enough to see clearly what lay on the table. It still looked like an adorable banquet, reminiscent of a child's birthday party. Plates piled up with sweets, cute pictures with drinks all kinds of pumpkin-shaped ornaments. They were all decorated in a Halloween style. And while this probably wasn't the time to be thinking it, Maria would surely have been delighted to see all this. That was the state of the table they sat in front of, apparently asleep. It was an eerie scene, as though a small, fun-looking Halloween party had been stopped in time. When she approached even closer to them, she realized that there were snacks scattered all over the floor. Candies, cookies, soda and chocolates, all with heavily fantasy themed pat packaging. They were all scattered across a carpet covered with blackberry and cranberry jam. <laughs> Rosa and the rest finally realized what the situation was. It was a Halloween party. A banquet for those not of this world. Kraus, Natsuhi, Eva, Hideyoshi, Rudolf and Kyrie were seated in chairs, apparently asleep. But all that... How could you tell that they were dead and not simply sleeping? That was because they'd been vertically sliced open from the chest to their stomachs. The 
six of them had sat down at a Halloween party before having their stomachs split open, killing them. Then the jam covering the floor must be what overflowed from their stomachs once they had stuffed themselves completely, right? No! The contents of their stomachs had been scattered all over the floor. And that wasn't all. Out of their stomachs, it was almost as though... Almost as though... As though they poured out. As though snacks had overflowed from there. Candies and cookies, soda and chocolates had poured out, stained with blood, and had scattered across the floor. What could have happened to cause this? It's almost as though their stomachs were stuffed full to bursting with sweets, and it all poured out when their stomachs split open. Rosa remembered a certain shocking meal, a turkey that had been served at her own birthday. When it had been cut open with a knife, out flowed one of her favorite foods. But since she hadn't been told what was inside, the deep, deep red ketchup omelette rice poured out like bloody maggots. Pulsing, dripping, slimy, pulpy, squelching. The trauma of her youth was revived. Rosa felt a monster raging inside her stomach as the acid started to rise. Unable to hold back, she threw it all up on the floor. Her empty stomach had nothing but stomach acid. The scene in front of her was no fun Halloween party now. The three couples were enshrined right there, their stomachs vertically wrenched open, wrenched open with a... So many snacks have been stuffed in there. Pulpy, squishy. Blood and guts and sweets were overflowing onto the floor. Blood, stained, sticky, sticky, sloppy, pulpy. Sweet snacks that made your fingers stick together. Gummy, gummy. Ah, but stained with entrails. Sloppy, pulpy. What was that I stepped on just now? That didn't feel like a candy or cookie. Or soda, or a chocolate. Ah, uh, I'm scared. What did I step on? I can't even look at the bottom of my foot. Ah, uh, what a, what a gruesome Halloween party. From far away, it had looked truly beautiful, fantastical, and fun. But from up close, it was horrible, disgusting. And yet somehow, still beautiful. Rosa's wild thoughts tried as best as they could to escape her throat with a loud voice that was neither a scream nor a roar. If a world so tied to reality hadn't come out of Goda's mouth, Rosa and the rest would probably have found themselves unable to escape that nightmarish party even now. But it wasn't because they thought the police might be able to do something. If they didn't keep yelling about the police, it felt as though another seat might be set up at this demon's party and given to them. Their own chests felt like they were expanding unpleasantly from the inside. Rumbling, churning, and it was surely because candy was about to overflow from their stomachs. Rosa, once again tortured by a desire to vomit, threw her stomach acid up on the floor. And then she searched. Search to see if there was any candy in it. (laughs) 
Rosa coughed violently again, forcefully spitting out the stomach acid that had been burning in her throat. She realized that by now, her whole body had been covered in a filthy sweat. Why even bring Dr. Manju here? It's a bit too late for medical care. The servants accepted their orders and dashed outside. After watching them leave, Rosa once again stared at her siblings, with whom she'd spent good times in bed, and their partners. Though there could be nothing more tragic than the scene, for some reason, she was tempted to describe these fantastical deaths as beautiful.